Uh, thank you everyone for coming here. It's one of the last talks of the day and I know most of you are dead already. Um, we'll be talking about hybrid search, which has become like a buzzword of its own and has been talked about uh, in this conference as well. So maybe first a bit of interaction with you guys. Like how many of you have tried semantic search or vector search? Can you raise your hands and keep them, keep them. Good. How many of you have it running in production? Mm. Mm, quite nice. For how many of you it works better than pretty old, like Lexical DM25 search. Lexic search? Much less. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a bit less. So today we'll be talking about hybrid search, which kind of combines uh, the best from both worlds. Uh, a bit about us. Uh, I'm Seva. I've been in search for about seven years, four of those in search startup management, like product and project management. And I'm one of the maintainers of a tool called Metrank. Uh, we'll be talking a bit about it today as well. And Tam Roman, um, worked in different areas of machine learning for quite some time and converged to search. And so right now I'm working uh, in Delivery Hero, you won't believe, on search. So typically when uh, people talk about hybrid search, uh, it's, quite spe spe it's quite specific to their use case. They say that this is better than that, uh, our approach is the best. However, they don't give any numbers. Uh, you cannot compare your models, your use case to theirs. And like, there are a few reasons for that. Uh, they have their own tools and data, so you cannot use their data. Uh, they cannot share inside information, especially for publicly traded companies like Romans. Yeah. However, everyone basically has the same problem, like how, make your, how to make your visitors happier, how to make your business happier by providing better conversion rates to increasing your revenue. And you usually do that by combining user intent, uh, their language, semantics of the products or items you have. And uh, it would be actually great if there were quite a lot of open data and open tools where you can check your model against different data sets. And uh, there are a few tools already. There is a thing called Track, which is both a conference and a contest uh, where you can take part. Uh, there's bare set of models, uh, a set of data sets, sorry, uh, where you can test your model uh, against those data sets. However, they're not e-commerce specific. And uh, Amazon released uh, quite some time ago a data set called ESCI. It's quite a big one, almost 2 million products uh, with a lot of labels. It also has hard queries uh, in different languages, like this platinum drywall tools, whatever. Um, so it's quite useful when you kind of want to test it out on your model. Uh, it actually consists of two data sets. There is a small one. Uh, it has less exact matches, kind of more irrelevant products. And there is also a large one, which is a superset of the small one. So this is how the uh, product in the data set looks like. Um, you can see it's text focused, uh, so like some product data. But it also has an ID, which turned out to be an Amazon ID. So you can scrape Amazon and enrich your data set. That's what we did. Um, this is how the... Uh, no? Yeah, that one wrong. So <laughs> try to say okay, so we, whatever. Yeah, we've reached the data set. Uh, now it contains <laughs> reuse, uh, metadata, bullet points, so not only title and descriptions. So what we're going to do today with hybrid search, uh, we will start off with the baseline BM25 uh, that everyone can do in Elasticsearch, purely seen, whatever. We will add uh, 2017 style uh, learn to rank into the mix, and then we will do some vector search with B encoders. Uh, we'll fine tune them. We'll also do cross encoders, fine tune them, and uh, all of that will be done with Metrank, and Roman will show us how. Yeah, so not like with Metrank, but <laughs> just with hands and head. But uh, the goal is just to go through the journey of building some sort of a hybrid search over the public data set with some shared knowledge and experience you can reproduce later in your companies. So, but if you start speaking about hybrid search and you have some background in machine learning, it's nothing more than ensemble learning. So ensemble learning, you take some weak predictors, you combine them together and get not that weak predictor, hopefully. But by weak predictor, it doesn't mean that it needs to be like completely stupid. It can be just 
uh, describing a specific feature in your data set, like number of stars and reviews is also a weak predictor. BM25 is also kind of a weak predictor. It's strong on lexical similarity, it's bad on semantic similarity, but it's just covering a part of your hybrid search journey. Uh, the typical approach of doing hybrid search is like uh, combining everything together with some sort of a formula. There are ways to have this custom formula. You can use reciprocal rank fusion, like uh, described by folks from Elasticsearch and VV8 in this conference. But at the end, the problem is that these distributions of your it's BM, BM25 distribution from the ACI data set. So it's like a real data, like where you take the queries, take the documents, search. That's how it looks like. And that's the cosine distance distribution. They're kind of a very different. Uh, there was also talk from Elasticsearch folks, and they showed similar distribution for Mono T5 model. It was looking very obscure, like flat, 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 and just going to the sky at the end. So it's kind of a tricky to combine them together because they're very different, uh, but still you can do it somehow, like, I don't know, normalize, do this reciprocal rank fusion, but still, every time you touch your model, you do some sort of fine-tuning, the distribution changes, you need to readapt your way of hybrid search. Um, you still might need to, might want to introduce something else than by just uh, relevancy, maybe like a business metrics, click through rate, and good luck finding proper weights for correlated features if you have linear combination of them. And uh, in some cases, the dependency might not be linear. So what if you shouldn't care about semantic similarity if your BM25 score is super high? It's just like exact term match. Uh, so we're going to use MetaRank for that, but uh, more like an advanced learn to rank toolbox just to simplify our journey and not writing one gigabyte of uh, crappy Python code. But at the end, it's just a way to run Lambda Mart on your data, and it will solve a couple of problems of uh, mm, building this type of system with just you take uh, you optimize, explicitly optimize for ranking for NDCG. You can handle nonlinear dependencies because it's like gradient boosted trees, and it can handle correlations because it's gradient boosted decision trees. Uh, and with your search, you usually focus on recall, so uh, how to limit your uh, data set for this particular query from 1 million products to maybe 100, and then you focus on precision with some sort of a ranking tool to, with a more complicated algorithm, I don't know, Lambda Mart, neural networks, whatever. So actually, we're not going to use any of this complicated stuff from MetaRank, but there's a standalone mode which, when you don't care about everything, it's just in memory, you just feed it file with a feature definition and get some numbers at the end, so like this evaluation. That's what we're going to use. So let's start with a baseline. And uh, uh, it's not a BM25, but even more dummier baseline, like random ranking, because the ESCI data set is very rich on exact matches, on the uh, good matches. And then even if you rank randomly, you still eventually get quite a lot of relevant products, because there's just a lot of relevant products there. So it's some sort of a lower bound on a DCG. So if you train your Lambda Mart on a single feature which is random, that's what the, the worst case you can do. So if you're doing below that, you're like causing harm directly. <laughs> So that's how it looks with MetaRank, whatever, it just takes maybe a couple of minutes, but at the end we get a number. So it's like in DCG at position five, uh, five is kind of a good place for uh, e-commerce style search because people really don't go on the page two, they sometimes really don't even scroll. So, but at the end the numbers are still just on a different scale and uh, the the layout is still the same. OK, let's do the actual baseline, which you probably already have. So that's the BM25. BM25, you can, of course, index this data set in Elastic, search for some specific queries. That's kind of a complicated. The data set has multiple fields. Then you need to have, actually, optimal boosts for them. But uh, how you can 
use some techniques like learn to boost. You can use ESLTR plugin, but for our use case, just for the evaluation, it's kind of a bit complicated. But technically, if you stare long enough into the description of what how BM25 is computed, you can understand that actually you don't need Elasticsearch to compute BM25 because it consists of two parts, like some uh, frequency of a term in the document with some constants and free and inverse documents frequency which is depends on number of docs containing the item so you only need this term frequencies like how many docs containing this particular item if you have them you technically can just compute bm25 without using anything at all that's what we actually did so that's you take Query title compute BM25 with English standard analyzer from Lucene using the term frequencies, and you'll get this number. So that's kind of a good improvement compared to random ranking. Uh, but you might wonder that we're just only searching over title and we have three more fields. So let's just mix them together into an ensemble of weak predictors like we planned and train a lambda mark model on top of that. So that's the number we'll get. So we're going from 75 to 76. You might wonder why it's the improvement is so small. But if you see the actual product titles on this Amazon data set, that's a real products. And people probably spend years optimizing the title to match all possible queries that might hit this product. So you, if you're introducing description, bullet points, whatever, they're already there in the title. So you're not introducing that much of new information for this particular data set. So if you're a marketplace and kind of a there is competitors fighting with each other on your marketplace, you might expect this type of uh, situation when your product title has all the possible keywords. Uh, you can go this way of building a 2017 style le learned rank model by introducing like categorical features. The dinosaur is just to describe the, the, the style of the ranking we're trying to invent. So just matching on the material, color, category, you can take some numbers like number of stars, number of rating, the price, weight, whatever. Just uh, throw everything and hope that it will stick. And you're not just going that far beyond from 76.2 to 76.7. That's kind of a small improvement. And now uh, let's talk about the actual neural search and semantic search. Uh, the traditional uh, hybrid search approach is that you have multiple types of retrievals matching different uh, um, characteristics of your data set, like you do some term search, you do some vector search over the embeddings, and then you combine them. But the question is where you can find these embeddings. Most of the vendors are kind of uh, push it to you, like, OK, that's what we support, or that's hugging face, choose your favorite one. Uh, there are some commercial providers, uh, like Sentence Transformers. Everyone knows about them, probably. And you can take uh, and craft your own embedding based on like Sentence Transformers. Uh, <coughs> this vector search approach <coughs> is mostly about uh, computing and embedding of your document, of your query, and just finding the nearest documents to your query with some advanced algorithmical tricks. You can do indexing of these documents offline. And the only thing you need to embed in query time is the actual query. Uh, and you can use this HNSV for approximate key and search. Uh, there is a model everyone likes to mention, like a go to start, this mini LM L6 V2. Uh, in the sentence transformers, it's not the fastest one, it's not the smartest one, but it strikes a good balance between being smart and being fast, so somewhere in between. So it's small enough to run on CPU, you don't need to GPU to run it, but it's still kind of a precise on semantic search, but maybe over generic. Uh, if you're in Python, running it in Python is like just nine lines of code considering sentence, uh, like spaces and all that stuff. Uh, but in the case of delivery here, and that's an often co common situation when your search uh, infrastructure not related to the actual data science is written in Java, you're in problem. So you need to like either have a microservice invoking 
the model or that will just overcomplicate thing, but you can actually do it in Java if you go ONNX way. So you translate your model to your ONNX and do some not as nice Java code, but it's actually doing exactly the same thing that uh, sentence transformers are doing. You don't need like to read it that much because it's kind of the way you can see it in Vespa, in Open search model serving in Elasticsearch, that's kind of that's the way they do. It's a bit of more manual. So you do tokenization, converting your string into numbers. Then you prepare these tensors of numbers to feed in your network. You feed it in your network and you get the predictions. So it's a bit more complicated, but still not that bad, uh, as seen like almost everywhere. Uh, in practice, we try to use it uh, as a, just to simplify all that stuff in MetaRank, but uh, at the end, that's what we'll get if we use this mini LM for this particular use case. So you might notice that it's a bit better than your old BM25, but uh, maybe it's the same as Lambda Mart 2007 steel style. Your mileage might vary because it depends on the data set, because, but mini LM tries to strike to be generic enough to work on all of them data sets, oh, most of the data set, but probably in a not super optimal way. But can we go deeper? Because MiniLM is not the only one. We might have some sort of a compute budget, or maybe we have a large compute budget for a GPU. So what we take something heavier, like this one's from Sentence Transformers. It's like the MiniLM L6 is a small one. You can go a bit larger, like 10 times larger, and just to see how it will be. So with a bit larger, you, you can see that it's slightly better, but still not worth it to spend that much time and resources running 10 times more complicated model to get this type of improvement. You can also convert any type of model from hugging face to with the uh, trans ONNX transformers. There is also up to something, because that became deprecated one week ago, that like a typical for Python ecosystem. But uh, it will hint you the proper query if you want to be future proof. Uh, but at the end, this cosine similarity you get from semantic search is yet another ranking feature in your ensemble of weak models. It can also be somehow weak because it's not covering everything. Uh, that's the numbers we'll get if we start mixing. That's kind of the hybrid search, that you, the DM25 with vanilla mini LM. And uh, you see that the jump, so both uh, traditional search and both uh, semantic search are on par with quality. But if you start mixing them together, they're starting co covering different areas in your data set. So there are some queries which are specific on terms. There are some queries specific on semantics. And you can combine them together to get something even better than each of these approaches separately. And if you introduce some sort of a metadata there, it doesn't really make any sense. Uh, you can if you want, but uh, that was a surprise for us. Uh, but we can go deeper, still deeper, with fine tuning. Fine tuning seems to be quite simple if you read some uh, read some documents on like uh, towards data science. But uh, under the hood, if you go deep enough, it requires quite some knowledge. But still, there is a lot of tooling available to do it. So at the end, fine tuning is you just take existing generic large language model from hugging face from sentence transformers, you define some sort of a loss which apply, uh, uh, describes your problem. So for a case with a semantic search, you can say that's OK, that's a cosine similarity loss. And you start feeding it with your uh, own data set, not like the whole data set ever, or like sentence transformers, which fed 700 million titles from Reddit, so if it, it would probably rank toxic comments quite well, but not might work good for uh, e-commerce. But you feed your data set and trying to minimize this loss by updating the weights of your transformer. So you lose generalizability of your model, but you tune it for your particular use case. Uh, that's a question, where should you start? There are plenty of different neural network models available. Uh, you can take something not having any clue about uh, sentence similarity, uh, but you need quite a large data set to actually learn it 
learned ranking of your data. You can take something which already knows something about ranking, but just fine tune it a bit. There are not so many data needed for that, but uh, there are not so many recent models available. And uh, to train, to fine tune your model, you need actually triplets. Like, OK, that's the query, that's the positive document, that's the document, and that's the number, your relevancy, like a judgment. What, is, what do you think? Is it like relevant or not? If it's a cosine similarity, so it should be like between 0 and 1, or min minus 1 and 1, but whatever. In our use case, with the ESCI, uh, the data set doesn't have numerical labels. It has like semantic labels, so it's exact match, uh, substitute, uh, complementary, and irrelevant. And there are different approaches on how can you map it. So you can map it linearly, just from 1 to 0, or you can map it exponentially. We're going to try to approach this and see what will stick. Uh, and the good thing is that you don't need hard negatives for that. You can have like something in between, but it's quite slow to converge it. Uh, there are other approaches. You might have it faster uh, convergence using some more tricky loss functions, like you need the triplets of query, a positive example, and a negative example. So it's like a contrast for this particular query. That's a relevant, that's a relevant one. You can do the same thing with the mapping of uh, labels into the uh, positive and negative examples. And usually in the docs, that's the picture from the beer paper, or I might be wrong, but still the idea is that if you have hard negatives, you're fine, but l oftentimes you don't, can't be absolutely sure that this document is actually a negative. So that's a bit of a tricky, uh, but it's fast to converge. So your negatives need to be hard enough. You can take like a random document for a SOX query, which is a refrigerator, and say that that's a relevant product. But it's quite trivial for a model to figure out that it's uh, actually a negative. But if you make a negatives which are very similar, like, like it's even hard for me to distinguish between muffins and non-muffins here. So if you make your training data like this, then it will try to figure the semantics. OK, that's the distribution of i's should be like this, and it should be. So you can get it. Uh, actually, uh, you can also use implicit feedback as a source of labels. For example, that's kind of a case with food search, when for some positions, uh, for some queries, you can uh, definitely say with a high confidence that people are clicking more on this product. So there is like a statistically significant difference in number of clicks on average and on this particular product. So it seems to be like a good, so like a good positive label. There are some, like you introduce something irrelevant for a kebab and it's not kebab and uh, people are not clicking on that, so you can assume that it's a relevant one. If it's, you have a confidence, if you don't have confidence, you just don't do anything because you have no idea that's it. But uh, that's actually an example of fine-tuning code. That's, that's literally, you can add imports there and there is data set loader, but that's it. So just reading the JSON, that's the whole code you need to write to do a fine-tuning. And that's not that much at the end. If you have a GPU, it would be even fast. Uh, so from my experience, you need to, like, uh, the better GPU you have, the better. The, largest, the larger the batch size is, the better. You don't need to do 10 different passes over your data set because neural network are fine figuring it out from a single pass, and there are plenty of different cheap GPUs available if you want to play, like Collab, Kaggle, Vestai is just renting some weird GPUs from people doing mining on some countries uh, you never know existed. But it's very cheap. I tried. It works. Uh, because if you try to do it on your uh, CPU, uh, you might be surprised with the difference. That's the one I have at home. It's 200 bucks from eBay, so it's not like you know uh, breaking things. So it's six minutes. If I do it on my CPU, it's 20, 240 minutes for the same task, for the same uh, data, just uh, like 
40 times difference. OK, let's go for the actual fine tuning. Let we, we do some sort of fine tuning that we can compare it with how it goes. So when we fine tune, we also like go like from 76 to 77, almost 78, which is a nice breakthrough compared how hard it was to push like on a third digit. And uh, that's just using exact matches and relevant products from the data set. If you add more negatives, like all which is not exact, whatever, it's relevant, but you get much more negatives, you will go even to 78. But uh, you can go with this cosine similarity. We didn't make it much better if you do linear mapping, but if you do exponential mapping, like the same thing like we did with this exact matches and all others as negatives, but with cosine similarity, you can go to 78.8, which is very nice. Uh, improvement compared how hard it was just to cross the 76 with a traditional approach. Uh, but technically, you can go beyond that. If you have some time to wait for training, you can take a larger model. And what will happen if we'll take a larger model like uh, this? That's what we got from the previous attempt, like a best number. And if you take this uh, 12 layers, it's kind of the same, not that much better. If you take this last model, which is 10 times more, you can go almost to 80, which is it, for me, it seems like magic. You just throw more layers, and it's getting better, better every step. What will happen if you go 1 billion, like 10 billion? It will just start invading uh, the world. Uh, yeah, so you can uh, combine this thing with the traditional BM25 search, like hybrid search, but with the, your uh, neural search is fine-tuned for your data set, and you can see that you can even go much beyond like 80, which is kind of a nice improvement considering that uh, fine-tuning is not actually a rocket science, like 10 lines of code with a bit of a data loading and preparation. Uh, there is still some uh, cost on doing it. So if you're going to our deep model, deep models, it's just a benchmark to run those models on a CPU with ONNX with a one word search query. And you see that impinet is already 64 milliseconds, which might be close to the latency budget you might have for your search, at least. And it will go up if you have two, two, two words, three words, whatever. It will just go slower and slower. So some uh, preliminary uh, conclusions about the approach of just a hybrid search is that the larger the LLM, the better. Uh, fine tuning is not a rocket science, and you can get a huge relevancy boost for free. Every time you just take a newer model and go and say that my A-B test is even better than before. So uh, And uh, ESCI is a very specific data set, so probably uh, if your vendors are not spending that much time sale optimizing titles, it might be different. And uh, if you don't have GPU, have some somewhere like I like I did on eBay. That's fine. And now we're going beyond the traditional understanding of a hybrid search because hybrid search it means that you're uh, still doing two ways of of retrieval. But there are actually a thing called cross encoders, which are a bit of a painful approach to neural networks. So with a traditional uh, semantic search approach, you have this cosine similarity to find similar documents to your query. But what if you just disregard all this cosines, slap a couple of neural network layers on top of your transformer, and ask it to say you the number, like, OK, is it uh, doc this document is relevant for this query or not? Uh, you can uh, you can't use cosine similarity, so you just uh, you're trading performance for quali for quality uh, in sentence transformers in SBIRT. There are a couple of pre-trained cross encoders, and there the API is not much different compared to the traditional vector search. But you feed query document and it will tell you the number between zero and one. At the end, you might see cross encoders as asking ChatGPT, is this document is relevant for this query. There are actually papers uh, trying to run some evaluations on this approach on some public data set, and surprisingly, it works. Uh, but you're kind of limited by the technology of uh, our time, so because it can be quite slow. 
Uh, with cross encoders, if we take one from the sentence transformers and run it as is, it was trained on MS Marco dataset. MS Marco is search requests from Bing. Uh, that's quite big data set uh, and like a reference, a standard and different evaluation strategies of uh, vector search and apply it to our e-commerce. So MS Marco is a very old data set, so it haven't uh, so it haven't seen anything related to Amazon. And you can go from 76 to 77 just you know for free, just ranking something according to the logic of uh, the Bing data set. Uh, but you can, of course, as we know, we can fine tune models. So we can lose a bit of generalizability and fine tune it for a particular use case. So fine tuning cross encoders even easier in sentence transformers than B encoders because there is only single way, single loss supported. Uh, so that's the whole code. And uh, that's uh, the actually the leaderboard from now. And if we fine tune, we just go significantly beyond 80 with just a cross encoder. And then we can go even beyond that, taking the larger model. So it's like 81.3, which is a very nice result out of you know nothing. And uh, for this particular ECI data set, it's like five minutes of fine tuning with 10 lines of code. And at the end, we can converge like slop everything we got in this talk together, cross encoders, bi encoders, whatever we have just in a single ranking ensemble, and just to see how good it is. So that's the number we get. Uh, <coughs> uh, but uh, jokes aside, you can see so how we're, we're struggling with a traditional 2017 LTR approach. And like in 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, we just went beyond reasonable threshold with this quality. And probably you can go beyond that if you spend more time or you have a, like a cluster of GPUs, probably. There is still a price to pay. That's a screenshot from the beer paper. And everything seems to be OK apart from the latency on the top there for cross encoders, which is like six seconds for ranking. Why not? Uh, the, your customer will wait. I was like, uh, is it really that slow? So we did some sort of a benchmark. That's uh, uh, the SMS Marco cross encoder for different depths of the ranking. So 100 products, 700 milliseconds for ranking. So you should be accurate. They're slow. And this cross encoder is, is very small. That's a very small network, but it's still quite slow to do. So. There are some tricks to do to speed things up, because usually in e-commerce, the queries are repetitive. You can cache things. With cross encoders, you can't cache the embedding, because there is no embeddings, but you can cache uh, input, like memoize uh, the query and the product and the score, and just don't re score existing for the same query for the same product again and again. But still, it's kind of a slow thing to do. And so. In the end, uh, does it actually make sense uh, to use cross encoders? It kind of does if you, you'll probably have a similar infrastructure uh, later on. So you just re rank some top like five, 10 products uh, with cross encoders because they're slow and really, really expensive to run. And uh, if you are on Amazon, you're kind of, you need to pay. Um, this one, these two ones are all GPUs uh, that you can get on Amazon. And this one is a bit newer, and you can see the price is like 10 times higher. They and announced P5. Uh, you can progress. It's 200,000, probably. Prob probably, yeah. <laughs> and you'll probably need a couple of machines for you know, reliability and that sort of thing. In the beginning, we've mentioned uh, Track. Uh, and actually, they've released uh, an e-commerce track on the Track conference. And uh, there are several tracks uh, for the Track. Uh, you can do end-to-end -end retrieval. So like search over the whole corpus uh, of the data set. You can do ranking, so basically what we've done here. Uh, you can also do multimodal search if you want. And this is a competition. It started on the 1st of May. Uh, you still have some time to compete in there. There are no prizes, but you know if you're the best in the world, you're the best in the world. Intellectual superiority. Yeah. The prize. Um, search it on GitHub, uh, submit uh, your models, uh, compete. And uh, everything that Roman have shown today is actually available uh, in our GitHub. Uh, it's called ESCI Playground. Uh, it's, you can also play on the demo.metrank.ai. I will try to, yeah. Um, I don't know. OK. 
can I? I'm just yeah. uh, got used to writing code like so this. So it's just, uh, uh, it, it will show you the data much. set, the ACI data set with all the products, okay. and it's handy to have images. And uh, you can use different retrieval models, so B encoders. Cross encoders are quite slow, like we don't have Amazon's GPUs, we don't have money for that. Uh, but B encoders are okay, so you can just check different results uh, with re ranking as well. Um, now you feel the pain. Yeah. And you can continue it. We'll yeah, just. we'll probably continue the talk <laughs> and then, uh, then see the results afterwards. Um, so yeah, like conclusions, uh, you can choose only two of the three, as always, sometimes even one. Um, you can do fine tuning, as Roman has shown, it's not really hard, just a few lines of code, and that's it. And uh, like each approach on its own is not a silver bullet. Uh, you can do B encoders, you can go with traditional uh, BM25 search, you can throw lambda mark. But if you do, if you combine all of them, that's when you can get some really cool results. And let's see if uh, it finished. Yeah. Oh, well, five seconds. Yeah, five seconds. So. <laughs> And that's it. Thank you very much. That was really entertaining. <laughs> it's but available for the last talk. a lot. It was yeah. very interesting. I have the suspicion there will be questions from the audience. Thank you for the talk. I have two quick questions. So the first one is, uh, the first stage retriever in all your benchmark was always the same or was actually in line with the second stage re-ranker? Mm -hmm. So it was kind of, uh, it depends. So with cross okay. encoders, uh, with cross encoders it was uh, like BM20. So it, it was just sort of a ranking task. So you always take like top 100 products. With, with the CSCI data set, it's not like a retrieval type of a benchmark. It's more like a ranking type of benchmark because you got candidates which are with the labels and you need to rank them. You can like unfold it into a retrieval type of benchmark when you not limited to this labeled list, but you have the whole data set, which some parts of that is are unlabeled. But for this particular benchmark, it's just the ranking benchmark. It's 20 or 30 top products uh, prepared by Amazon. So Perfect. Uh, the second question is, do you plan to have like an episode two where the random re-ranker re has like a much lower NDCG? Because we started with, from a very high NDCG from the random as well, right? I think it depends just on the data. So that's just the specifics of the Amazon data set because there is half of the, it's a ranking task. You get 20 results and 10 of them are relevant. And how hard you can shuffle it, you will still get some of them eventually on the top. That's why the NDCG is higher. So yeah, you so like as we mentioned, uh, there are not that many open data sets that you can use. Mm -hmm. It's great that we have at least Amazon because it's probably the only e-commerce specific one. Uh, so like it's, it's a problem of lack of data, open data sets. Okay. So maybe in the future you will be able to, <laughs> yeah, like to experiment. Yeah, throw us a data set, we'll, we'll try it out. Thank you for the talk. <laughs> Thank you for the for the very nice talk. Um, so, if I understand it correctly, you're mostly ensembling the uh, the re rankers themselves, right? Uh, what are your thoughts on actually adding other sort of classical LTR features like um, properties of the query or um, other sort of yeah uh, features of uh, of query and documents? So, this uh, prefix of uh, metadata, it's like all of them at once. And you can see that you uh, rarely g g have some better, so I'm just trying to find a better numbers. Somewhere, maybe with this meta, not here, it's like LTR to the way. So, uh, 
It's usually adding metadata doesn't give you that much of a value if you use neural networks. For, for me, it's like, okay, let's add the uh, price uh, somehow there. But at the end, if you have a large enough model, it will figure out price. You, if you want to have a category, it will eventually figure out that it's actually a category. It might not even match your understanding of categories in your store, but it will still understand that these things are quite similar in but, but it's defined by customer behavior. So if you search for a sofa, these products are kind of close in this embedding space, so they might be related. So it, it can implicitly deduce a lot of metadata. That's my hypothesis, so not absolutely sure. But that's why probably why uh, metadata is not giving that much of a value here. Maybe if you mix, if you measure not in DCG, because in DCG is kind of a, not a business metric, so and measure for conversion and you mix click through rate or conversion there, uh, that might be different. But that's another story how to optimize uh, semantic search for profit. So I'm, I'm used to the beer benchmark, so. Um didn't know the Amazon benchmark. So, and uh, what what is very surprising for me, if I see these baseline numbers of NDCG of zero uh, point eight, that's for the beer benchmarks. That's incredibly good. Uh, so, how, how, but it's, it's can you explain ranking the difference? It's a ranking task. So, if you go for the track, track published the data. So, Amazon published in a, some weird parquet format, uh, which is hard to parse. Uh, beer translated it into traditional track style format with like corpus queries and. Uh, like relations, and uh, we're doing this type of ranking. So we just re rank the, the documents which were supplied by Amazon within this data set. So you're talking in beer, beer is usually focused on a retrieval. Yeah. So it's not like, please rank this top 20 products. We don't even know how Amazon computed them, probably through BM25, but that's supplied by the, in the data set, that's what we use. In beer, it's in, uh, in this track, subtrack of track, they don't limit you with this top 25 mm -hmm. products. You have all two millions, and then you need to uh, search over two millions, and then you will eventually get mm -hmm. much lower in the CG. Mm -hmm. So if you run this data set through the beer benchmark, MTB benchmark, you will get in this retrieval variant, then you'll get much lower in the CG number. But I think that's like the relation is still would be the same. Mm -hmm. So usually if you fine tune, you get better results. You lose generalizability of your model, but you trade it for precision in your particular data set. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is very simple. Have you tried it in a production e-commerce setting? And what was your finding? Did it match your offline results? Uh, so like Deliver here is a publicly traded company. So if I say that we improved click-through rate in something, I will have problems. Uh, because you then go to the market and purchase or short stocks, so that's the problem. So actually, I cannot say this, but at least with this particular data set, you can get some sort of a grasp on what improvement you might get by increasing the NDCG, and it might be specific to your use case how it will convert into the actual profits because it also depends on how you define, so what you're doing. If you're doing search of music on a subscription service, it's kind of not directly in DCG is converting to money. If you're doing e-commerce, probably directly, but it still depends. Yeah, that's also why we have the demo that you can play around with. Uh, as Roman said, it's not uh, used in production, uh, but you can play with it, you can run it on your own and see what results you get. But on average, usually, just from my experience, the better the relevancy, the happier the customer, and the happier the customer, the faster the customer purchases something. So hopefully it should result. But the, the improvement on the CG is quite a kind of a dramatic one. So probably it should. Do we have more questions? I 
to not see any raised hands. Oh, we do. Oh. Last minute, El Mary. Everyone was like, oh, finally this is the end. <laughs> no, <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Be beautiful stuff. I love it. Um, have you done any some sort of sensitivity analysis to see which inputs had the most influence? Uh, sensitivity analysis, yes, but uh, usually this metadata doesn't matter that much. You might see it. Yeah, from, from uh, I have the numbers. They're not part of the data set. If you do the CSCI playground stuff, you will get this uh, uh, sharp scores for ranked features, uh, how they contribute in the final ranking. But just if to, to rephrase, usually the cross encoders are a bit higher than B encoders, and there is like a small amount of all other, and B encoders are kind of on par with BM25, and all that metadata is somewhere on the bottom. Still valuable, but that's how it usually feels like. Okay, so as a follow-up question, if the metadata doesn't matter, if the two things that matter are essentially the lexical score and the vector score, so those are the two things that matter the most, can you abstract from this model a simpler model that doesn't require uh, running the whole LTR um, that is some nonlinear model, right? I have a very crazy idea, like for this case, that uh, actually the, uh, Joe Bergen from Vespa mentioned E5 model yesterday, and if you read the paper, it's kind of a very novel approach to doing things that because they do some sort of a light uh, prompt engineering for while doing fine tuning. So what if you go beyond that and you just don't fine tune a model on title and a product, but you inject part of prompt. Okay, that prompt was made uh, by uh, someone from Berlin at uh, Wednesday, and that's the document which has this price and uh, this category in that title, and you do a fine tuning on that. And then it would be just a sp very specific type of embeddings which will also catch the context of the product price because it was part of the training data. If you put it into the mini LM model, like that's the price, and it was like with 10 million uh, connections, it's like uh, it's as smart as snail, so it won't do any conclusions of this number you put it. But if you explicitly say that, okay, that's the first token in your document is actually price, the second one is category, the third one is color, the first one is brand, and then others are title, and you fine tune, it will figure out the, how price uh, is connected with some specific features of your query, maybe even some, for some semantics of the query. Uh, will it work? How good it is? I don't know. I got this idea yeah. today. And, and also we'll probably need some prompt engineering uh, happening for that case. Okay, then I think we can uh, thank the speaker for these great talks again. Thank you.